Today we're going to be discussing uh, geolocating models using drones. So let's let's uh, kick it off. Community conversations provide opportunities for engineers, designers, and artists and makers to meet in a safe live virtual setting to share expertise, get to know leaders in your field, and grow your community network. The sessions are always supported by the Autodesk community managers to help guide the conversation, feed important insights back to the community, to Autodesk, and support participants in getting connected to the expertise you need. Next, the fun stuff, the rules. Just a quick uh, a note, this is a safe harbor statement. If we make any forward-looking statements talking about future functionality, we ask that you don't make any purchase decisions based on that information, that you make your decisions on the product as the product is today. So it's a good, good thing, you know, if, if we promise it's gonna have unicorns in it, we can't legally say there's gonna be unicorns in it, although we could actually do it. All right, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Sean Hurley. I'm the engagement manager for Autodesk Community. I'm a longtime technologist. I've been with the company 24 years and uh, in many different roles. Um, excited that you're here. I'm based in Bend, Oregon, and a little chilly. Matt. Excellent. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, a senior technical specialist on the AEC side. Uh, similar to, to Sean, you know, I guess you can kind of consider me a, a geeky technologist as well, you know, drones, lasers, AR, VR, XR, uh, anything that, uh, you know, has to do with, with cool technology. Um, it says based in Boston. Uh, technically, I'm in Connecticut, but I guess Boston is the closest uh, uh, Autodesk office. So uh, I've been with the company for a total of 13 months. So still kind of on the new side, but prior to that 25 plus years experience as a CAD BIM technology manager. Some of you uh, may know me from the, the Autodesk Expert Elite program. Um, you know, I've been around on the, the forums, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. Um, so yeah, it's a, that is sort of me in a nutshell. So with that, you know, looking at the AEC collection. So this is what you have access to. And this slide is probably a little bit outdated. I don't believe Dynamo Studio is part of that anymore. Um, but, you know, looking at, you know, 24 plus different applications in total. Um, but most people just kind of stick to their own little world, whether it's AutoCAD, Civil 3D or Revit. What we're going to take a look at today is how you can take advantage of a little bit more of this. So starting off with the Recap Photo, Recap Pro, InfraWorks, uh, Revit, Civil 3D, Formit. Hopefully, if there's time, we'll, we'll dive into Navisworks as well. But really starting to leverage all these different applications to, to create that, that geolocated model, which is super important when it comes to making sure everything is in the right place where it needs to be in the world. So taking that Revit model, exporting it to uh, use in Civil 3D, vice versa. You want to have those uh, correct coordinates, correct points for uh, you know, staking out columns out in the field, for example. Uh, so we're going to take a look at how we can utilize, you know, half a dozen or so of these applications. Real brief uh, overview of the workflow, um, kind of chunked it up into uh, little bits here based on the applications that are being used. I'm not going to go too deep into this because we're going to see a lot of this stuff live. So with that, I'm going to jump off video just to save on bandwidth here. Uh, because I do have quite a few applications open running in the background already. Uh, so taking a look at recap photo, right? So starting off with your drone photos. And before we dive too deep into this, I just want to point out that there are two different types of applications or, or projects that you can create with recap photo. There's the aerial, which is what we're going to be taking a look at, but there's also the object. And the object uh, is really anything that isn't tied into uh, a state plan coordinate system. So something like this statue, for example, or maybe a, a, a sign for an apartment complex or something like that. So not, you know, something that I guess really can be moved easily uh, versus a building, which takes a lot more effort, obviously. But, um, you know, typically something smaller like this would just be a project or, or an object project within uh, recap photo. Uh, so let's dive right into it, right? So 
creating our aerial project is as simple, and I say simple because it really is, right? So we're just going to grab all of our photos. In this case, I have 470, I think, uh, photos for this project. Uh, it's going to tell me how many cloud credits are required. I believe the new uh, pricing is three credits per 50 photos. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is these days. Um, so right off the bat, we could we could certainly go ahead and upload these, create our project. Uh, but what I want to do is actually kind of make this you know a little bit more realistic. You know, tie it into the into the actual location a bit tighter, right? So I can specify my coordinate system. Right now, it's already set to Connecticut NAD 83. That's where this project is located. Um, I have, uh, where did I put it? I have an XML file that contains all of my uh, points from a previous uh, run through this project. So everything is green right now. So basically I've picked at least four points uh, on these photos. And the great thing about these ground control points is it automatically filters out the images based on uh, their, uh, the, the metadata within the files themselves. So if we take a look at one of these photos, for example, scroll down we see the lat long information there so it's it's filtering out just the photos as it relates to uh, these shots that were that were captured on site all right so this is going to make that mesh a lot tighter it's going to make the point cloud tighter um, and, and really start to tie it down vertically um, with regards to the actual site so once you get your your ground control points set it's just a matter of giving your project a name. I'm just going to call it test. Uh, we have the option now to in, uh, upload directly to uh, Autodesk Docs, right? So I'm going to throw this up in not the field, but project files. I've got a drone flights. Yeah, so I would go through this, uh, go through this process here. And what's going on here? All right, well, so we'll select this folder, right? I'm not, I'm not actually going to go through this because I've already got it processed already. But um, you know, one of the outputs you get is that mesh file. So similar to what you just saw uh, with that horse statue, you get that, that three-dimensional mesh. Uh, you can also include the RCS, so the, the point cloud as well. Of course, we want that GeoTIFF file. And if your drone has... Uh, uh, if it captures that PPK or RTK uh, information, that metadata in the photos, it can take advantage of that as well. And I really wish this would carry over that coordinate system, uh, but in case it doesn't, we just select it there and we're good to go. Press start, it's gonna upload all these files to the cloud, process them, create the, the output that you specified and close this, cancel yes. And what you're gonna get, one of the files you'll see is this report. So it gives you a nice overview of your, your flight. So it shows you the entire area that was captured. Uh, you get a little elevation model as well. This image overlap is, is great because if you have some shots that for whatever reason, maybe the camera was out of focus uh, or you know too much uh, reflectivity based on water or glass or something like that, and the model just doesn't quite look right, you can get a good idea of what's going on with the, some of the overlap here in the, the elevation model as well. Uh, there's information about those ground control points that we saw earlier. Um, so a nice little overview of what your uh, project contains. Uh, additionally, let me jump over to my cloud project. So I uploaded all this stuff to my construction cloud project. I've got that, uh, that uh, GeoTIFF file, I've got the report that we just saw, the RCS file, the RCM, which is that mesh file. We've got, a, we've got two versions of the FBX. We've got one that's zipped, one that isn't. Uh, so just another version of uh, sort of that mesh uh, looking uh, model. All right, so that is recap uh, photo. And actually, let me just crack open this one. So this is that same once it spins up here, this is that same flight. And I just happened to crop out all the ground uh, from this model. And I'm going to actually use this uh, a little bit later on in, 
in the presentation here, but really just kind of just stripping out uh, the excess, uh, you know, we'll call it noise, right? So uh, just wanted to be left with just the, the building itself. Um, Recap Pro, so we've got that same, uh, same flight data, same model. But as we zoom into it, we can see that it's actually made up of millions and millions of points. I think there's upwards of uh, seven and a half million, if not more uh, points uh, from this flight. All right, so there's our, there's the start of our, uh, our project, right? So thinking of a workflow where you go out to a site or you're working on a project and you don't actually have the job yet, right? So maybe you just wanna grab that information real quick and get you know, some sort of model in place. You know, that's where you would start to do some of this reality capture. And jumping over to InfraWorks, right? So we want to take that information. We want to pull it into an InfraWorks model. So what we can do is fire up model, model Builder. And it's basically a Bing Maps sort of interface. We can see the uh, sort of the, the, the road type map. And then we can also look at it in a satellite image type of view but very similar to navigating any other map uh, left mouse button pan around the middle middle wheel will zoom in or out we can specify an exact location if you happen to know it in case i absolutely do know it and there's the that middle school that we were just looking at so i want to capture this area uh, there's a couple ways you can do this uh, you can either do based on the current extent of this map you can select a uh, rectangle and you can modify these grips if I can just grab them there we go so you can make it larger make it smaller you can do a polygon if you want to do a sort of an unusual shape uh, you can also upload a shape file so thinking of maybe uh, the limits of a city block or a county uh, as long as it is less than 200 square kilometers um, there we go. As long as the model, the area that you're trying to capture is less than 200 square kilometers, you'll be able to create that, that model. All right, so that is the area that I want to capture. Now, I've already done that uh, just in the interest of time. So once, once, the, uh, once you get that email notification or the tile pops up here, it says, hey, your model's ready to be downloaded. You can either save it locally or you can store it to the cloud. The great thing about storing it in that cloud project, be it BIM 360 or Autodesk Construction Cloud, you've got unlimited storage. So thinking about that, that first step of the drone flight, or if you're doing a laser scan, you know, the terrestrial laser scan, if you've ever had to deal with those files, you know that they could be massive in size. So we're talking gigs and gigs and gigs worth of data. Um, with, the, with the Construction Cloud or BIM 360, you've got unlimited data. So just store all that information up in the cloud. Don't worry about storing it on your local server or even worse, maybe a, a, an external hard drive, and which ends up getting passed around from one user to the next and ultimately locked in someone's desk as they go on vacation and nobody can access the data. Um, that's actually happened to me on a few occasions. So uh, nice little war story there. Um, but being able to keep it all in the cloud, you know, access it from anywhere, anytime as you need it. But this is the type, this is the type of model you're gonna get to start with uh, InfraWorks Model Builder. Depending on where you are, you may have more or less information. In this case, it's sort of a, a little bit of a rural suburban type area. So not a ton of actually really no building information whatsoever. Um, but I do get information regarding the roadway. So it knows that this is Raffia Road. It knows that this is uh, Post Office Road. It knows you know all, all these different attributes uh, associated with these objects. And you would get the same thing with with major buildings, uh, rivers as well, waterways. So all this is coming from OpenStreetMaps data. So we can actually see that just by right clicking or selecting on it. Where is that, Where is that? tooltip? There we go. And selecting the OpenStreetMap and it's gonna open up OpenStreetMap and show us exactly where that data source came from. Right, but we can augment all this uh, with some of that data that we just created in the in the form of the, uh, the drones, the point cloud, the mesh, 
Um, and that's kind of what I've got here. So I've got a model that's a little bit more built out. We've got some, some of these apartments actually in place. We've got some additional information pulled in from a uh, combination of ArcGIS online through the connector, uh, individual shape files. Uh, but we want to, you know, we want to pull in, let's start with the, uh, uh, those geotiffs, right? So going to our data sources and we want to pull it in as raster because that's what they are. Um, I've got those downloaded just again, in the interest of time and, and speed, I have them stored locally. And as it processes, there we go. Now, just because I imported it doesn't mean it knows exactly where it should be. So every time you pull in a data source, you must configure it. So basically telling InfraWorks, all right, you are this type of data source and this is where you're gonna live. So it's automatically pulling that Connecticut NAD83 um, coordinate system. So I can just hit close and refresh. And what we'll see once this spins up is those TIFF files right in this area. Now, just to give you a sense of how large these files are, you know, we're looking at just, just south of a gig for these four, uh, four tiles that make up this TIFF file. So again, another, you know, another great reason to, to store all that data uh, in the cloud. So once this finally loads up again, a gig, so depending on the, the size of the data source, it may, may be quicker, maybe slower. But now we have an accurate up-to-date view of that site, but you're saying, what is going on? Why, why do we see these, uh, these sort of black holes where the drone didn't capture any data? Well, we can easily take care of that, right? So go back to configure and under the color mask, I just wanna make sure black is selected, click okay, close and refresh. And once this is done, this will basically be transparent. So uh, while this is processing, any any questions, anything that popped up in the in the chat there, Sean? Yeah, we had a discussion on the limit of photos to process. And then uh, Brian said that sometimes his teams are well above a thousand. And I kind of mentioned that, you know, I've broken big projects up into segments um, or sometimes we oversample the amount of photos needed for a given project. But what's your experience been on that? Uh, so regarding the number of photos, I believe with the latest update of recap photo, it's up to 2000. Yeah. Um, I'd have to double check, but I'm pretty sure that's what I don't have. You know, I know I we were have, a thousand last year. Correct. There was, I could have sworn I saw something that said it's up to 2000. I don't have the latest update installed. Um, and this is recap pro, so that doesn't help. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's up to 2000. Um, I would have to double check. Um, my, my gut is saying it's 2000 right now, yeah. you know, along with that change in uh, number of cloud credits per, I think it was 50 photos. Every 50 photos is like three, three cloud credits. I should know this because I just did a, a, a recap webinar not too long ago, um, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. So that, that, that new change in, in some of the photos and the, the number. And I know I've oversampled before. I just set my, my drone to capture every three seconds. And realistically, I didn't need all that. Um, we do have one more. Um, even though one stores files in the cloud, doesn't working with them require a temporary local copy be placed on the C drive, at least during the session? For, so I'm assuming that's for you know, basically pulling those files into, say, Revit or uh, InfraWorks, Civil 3D, right. what have you. Uh, yeah, so through Desktop Connector, it does, it, it will cache those files. Um, there is a setting, you know, kind of getting a little bit, a little bit off course here, but there is a setting in, in Revit, for example. Um, where is it? Just to make sure... Uh, bah, 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 point just clouds. pointing it out to make sure you have the available local storage if you pull down something big. Yeah, so that that's yeah that's so that's another another thing to be aware of. Yeah, because because of those cached uh, copies of the files, um, you may. The first thing I would recommend is certainly clearing out your temp folder. Right, so easy way to do that is just the parent or uh, percent 
10% and then just delete anything that you can in this folder. So it's automatically going to bring you to the app data local temp. Um, you, know, you can also free up uh, space on the Autodesk docs or BIM 360. Uh, you know, whatever project you have there, you can free up some of the data there as well. Uh, yes, yeah, so, yeah, definitely something to be aware of, though, I guess, with, with those yeah. cached files. And thanks for that. And Nate confirmed uh, that it is 2000 is the new limit. Uh, is, that, is that Nate Philbrick? It is. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we did that, did that recap webinar not too long ago. Thanks, Nate. Appreciate that. Um, okay, so we've got that. So we've got that, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our GeoTIFF pulled into InfraWorks, right? So now we want to pull in um, that model, that, that mesh of the building again. So, so we get, uh, you know, better sense of where our, uh, you know, where everything is with regards to the existing conditions. So I'm going to go to 3D model. And actually what I didn't show was that, you know, through this process, I exported, you know, once I trimmed out what I didn't want, I exported this to an FBX file, uh, you know, save it wherever you want. You may want to mess around with the decimation just to, you know, try to find a sweet spot between file size and uh, visual clarity here. Uh, but something to, you know, something to take a look at. But again, I've already done this in the background uh, prior to this. So let's jump back to InfraWorks and find our FBX file. There we go. And open. And again, we need to tell it what it is because just because we bring it in, it doesn't know which of these uh, data sources it needs to be. Um, so it's going to be buildings. And we're going to say... Connecticut NAD83 because that's the coordinate system. Close and refresh. And give it a second to churn. See it populated over here. But where's our model, right? What I thought everything was tied into the coordinate system, right? That's what that's what recap photo told us earlier. It's not underground, it's not hidden, it's not. It's not anywhere, right? So how do we get that model to show up where it's supposed to? Well, the key to that is, lost my spot here, go back to my project. Um, in that FBX file, the FBX zip file, there is these two files. So we've got the result FBX and we have this result position file. We take a look at that position file that's going to show us the exact coordinates of this model. So what I need to do, I'm just gonna pull this off this onto the other monitor for now, uh, go back to InfraWorks and configure, and basically, you know, take these, get that dialogue, there we go. All right, so basically take this X, Y, and Z and transfer them over to uh, InfraWorks here. So under the offset, I'll do that one and I want to grab the next one here, paste that. If I can copy paste correctly, there we go. All right, close and refresh. Now, if I got my numbers correct, that should pop right up in there. I'm on. There we go. Perfect. Once it finally regenerates, there we go. All right. So now we've got that mesh model uh, laying on top of our ground, uh, you know, within, you know, context of the existing site here. Now I do want to modify my imagery. I want to pull this guy down a little bit just so I can see some of this other other context that was thrown in here. Give this a second to regenerate here. All right, so this is, you know, sort of a preliminary layout, you know, sketch, if you will, uh, of an area where we want to throw in a little, uh, you know, maybe a COVID testing building, right? So we've got some cars queued up here. We want to design something that will fit in here. So in comes Civil 3D. 
So we're going to jump over here. And for this to actually work, I'm going to, I will just close InfoWorks altogether because it kind of freaks out when you try to import uh, an InfoWorks model when it's already open. So Civil 3D, and I just realized I have 21 open, but regardless, uh, this will work with all the other versions. So everything else I'm running is the 22 version of, of Revit, InfoWorks. Um, uh, but that, that functionality does work in 21, Civil 3D 21 accessing an InfoWorks 22 model. So I am going to go out and grab my, uh, in this case, it's my connected BIM 2022 SQLite file. And this is a brand new drawing in Civil 3D, never been touched, nothing's been done to it. And right off the bat, it says, hey, you don't have a coordinate system set. So let's click that. And yeah, let's use the one in InfraWorks. So that's going to set my coordinate system in Civil 3D to match that Connecticut NAD 83 coordinate system. So that's cool, right? Now we move further down, we want to specify an area of interest to pull in. So I'm going to do select an area because I rarely ever want to pull in the entire extent of the model. Um, now, if you don't have uh, maps already set to show, you'll get a little pop up that says, hey, do you want to use maps so you can actually see where you're selecting? You can just say yes and you know not show this again, and it'll automatically display the maps every time. All right, so this is the area that I want to that I want to pull in. I'm just going to do a little rectangle like this. Wait for this to churn up as it reads the model. Any second now. There's quite a bit of data in there, and it's just filtering through everything. But once uh, once that dialog box comes back up, we'll be able to refine which objects we bring in. So you can define basically like a selection set, if you will, of which uh, which elements you want to pull into Civil 3D. Great thing about this is you can base this all off of your company template. So whatever your template is for uh, services, for alignments, for corridors, pipe networks, if that information resides in that InfraWorks model, it's going to be pulled across as these particular objects on your particular uh, styles. So I'm just going to say, I'm going to go with all objects, rather, rather small area and open model. And this should just take a, a moment or two to, to pull in this information. There we go. So it kind of zooms us out to the extent of uh, that entire InfoWorks model, that, that area there. It's chugging through. I'm going to turn off the map for a second because I want to show you something that's pretty cool. So because I have some component roads in InfoWorks, it automatically recognizes those as uh, assemblies. So it brings them, brings them over as assemblies, as corridors in Civil 3D. So you don't have to mess around with you know, recreating the wheel on, on any of this stuff. And you can see you know, the little tooltip pops up. It knows Raffia Road. So it, it's pulling, all, pulling across all this information. So you know, really reducing uh, the amount of work that you would need to do. Uh, you can also see we've got a couple different uh, uh, surfaces here. We've got, uh, we've got our existing, we've got our uh, proposed, you know, I did do a little bit of work on that InfoWorks model beforehand, but here's that existing. And one thing I didn't mention is the, uh, that terrain that comes across in InfoWorks, that's USGS uh, 10 or 30 meter data. So not super accurate, not super clean. You're not going to get those nice sharp breaks every time you see a retaining wall on a site. It's, it's a lot more of a rolling interpolated terrain, but it's a great start. Um, you know, here's sort of that uh, modified surface that I had created. Let's see a little bit more of a bank here around the, around the school, which would have been in this area here, All right? But the other thing we see is we've also got a uh, nice little uh, sort of reference for uh, where, that, where that site is, right? So we can see, uh, you know, this is where that little uh, uh, paved area was, this larger triangle here, that's where the grass is, and that's where we want to put our building, right? So, so we've got our, uh, our civil 3D model. Let's actually save this so we can, how are we doing on time? 
have a, I don't know if we're going to get to the Navis Works portion, but we'll see how we do. We'll just call this. Map. We'll just call this Convo. Yeah, you can set save this into your uh, your cloud project. I'm in the interest of time. I'm just going to. Yeah, you know, I'm not even going to save it just because we're. I want to make sure we get through a lot of this stuff. So, what you can do now is save your project to your cloud, and then wrong tab output publish that surface. Um, it's going to prompt me to save. Yes. All right. So I do have to save. All right. We'll, we'll just save it here. Cool. Hey, Matt. Yes. Kate had a good idea. She said we can always turn this into a series too. So you don't need to stress about getting the Navis working. <laughs> we can do that in the next one. So. We can certainly do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's see how far we get today though, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so publishing in the cloud, publishing that surface, you can select which of the surfaces you want. So depending on how many, how many services are in your project, you can toggle them on or off. Um, I actually just pushed this proposed ground to my cloud project. So specify that output out, output file, you know, where do you want that, that project or that file to reside um, within, in this case, Autodesk Docs. So you can drill down into your different hub into your project and the folder, you know, wherever you want to store that. Again, I've already done that. Um, so that's sort of step one in, in getting our, our Revit model uh, in place here. So I'm going to try to show you two different ways of setting the coordinates in Revit. Let's go with the first one, which is we've got nothing modeled in Revit whatsoever, brand new project, never been touched, never been, you know, nothing's ever been done to it before. So in our, uh, on the insert tab, we want to link the topo from that cloud project. And depending on the number of cloud projects you have or, or, or associated with and the number of, uh, number of hubs, number of projects, you know, this may take a little while to, to spin up. Plus, depending on your, your Wi-Fi connection, which is kind of lagging a little bit today. Just want to open this InfraWorks model back up while Revit is doing its thing over here. And you know, we can close. We're done with Recap Photo. We're done with Recap Pro. Kick those to the curb. No, we don't want to save. Try to free up some resources here as much as possible. All right, so while Revit is thinking here, I apologize, this was much faster earlier when I was doing it. All right, so let's talk through this if we, so basically what's, you know, what you're gonna see is a dialog box that pops up and it's gonna have access, uh, you know, it's gonna list all the hubs that you're associated with and then you can drill down into each of those hubs, you know, wherever that, that uh, topography file is that you pushed from Civil 3D up to the cloud. Um, select that file and it just comes in as a topo object in Revit. Um, now in this case, because it's a brand new Revit project, never been worked on before, what you would do is acquire the coordinates of that topo object. Um, and what you would see under the, you know, I'm just, this is, this is really bugging me. I'm going to kill this thing. <laughs> uh, do, 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 Revit. All right. Still just hanging out there in the background. All right. Um, you know, so what you would see under the, the manage tab, you go to your site and location. After you acquire the coordinates of that link topography, it's going to change from that typical dialogue, typical uh, interface, and it's going to show Connecticut NAD 83, so it, it knows exactly, you know, it's got that same coordinate system. Uh, you know, it's reading the same information. What is going on here? Oh, did it? All right. I guess I just needed to kill that. All right, so let's just kind of talk through it a little bit more, right? So the, you go into the, the location and site, this interface, this display will be gone. Instead, it'll say, you know, Connecticut NAD 83, it'll show lat long. Um, so you know right off the bat that it has actually acquired uh, the coordinates of that, uh, of that site. From there, you can start to model your, 
proposed building. Now that's you know sort of the uh, th that's one way of uh, of acquiring the coordinates. And the reason I wanted to show that, or at least explain it in this case, is because prior to the 22 version, that shared reference point tool that we're going to take a look at next was not included with the install. So a uh, perfect example was 2021. So that dropped in, I believe it was late April, early May for Revit um, and, and Civil 3D as well. That shared reference point extension tool download was not available until September. So if that was something that you were relying on using to, to set the location of your, your Revit model, you're pretty much out of luck uh, uh, you know, until that thing, until that tool is available, unless you do the, uh, that, that other uh, uh, workflow of acquiring the coordinates of that published uh, surface. But since we do have uh, that shared reference point tool, again, we're in 22, so it installs automatically. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually utilize that because that that gives us a it, it's a much easier way honestly of of locating your files so i've got this model here i don't have anything set right so it's just you know regular sort of out of the box stuff here um but what i do have set up you know sort of pre-baked uh, i've got this view set up that i would typically use um you know basically just showing walls, doors, windows, maybe some pads or something, maybe column grid lines, depending on the size of the file uh, that I would use to export to Civil 3D, right? So I'm going to take this file and I'm just going to export straight out to DWG. That's cool. So one thing you want to make sure of, oh, actually, let me jump back to this. Uh, your drawing units are the same. So Civil 3D, you know, if you're in the US, typically it's, it's feet. Uh, so just make sure that that is set as well in Revit. Next, I'm going to drag this up on the other screen. So I've got my project here, drawing for Civil 3D. We'll just call this Civil 3D export. I don't want to include any XREFs. And cool, all right. So hopping over to Civil 3D. So this is where we want to locate that, uh, that floor plan, right? So external references attach that DWG, and we're not going to care about uh, insertion points or you know specifying anything. We're just going to go specify on screen because we want to actually kind of rotate this into place. All right, so I'm just going to do this real quick. And we'll throw it right there. OK, cool. So we want our building to be somewhere in that vicinity which again is this pad area right here in our infraworks model all right so in comes the uh shared reference point tool and it's not under add-ins which you would probably think would be a logical place but it's still still sitting under toolbox uh on the tool space here so under the subscription extension if you remember the uh, way back in the day, they were those extensions. Um, it's still called that, and it's still buried under toolbox and not add-ins like everything else these days. But anyways, uh, right-click on it, execute. It's going to prompt you for an origin point. And I'm going to pick this point here and then prompt you for a quasi-north point. So I'm going to select this one here. Again, we want to make sure our units are consistent, right? So Revit's in feet. Civil 3D is in feet. Is that international in. feet or US feet? That was a question in there. Uh, let me back up. I don't believe it. I would have to find out. There's only one, only one option for feet. For feet. Yeah. It's a good question. I'll dig into that and uh, you know try to get that answer out to you guys. Uh, but regardless, uh, feet okay. Yeah, so now it's going to prompt you to save an XML file. So it basically has those coordinates, those that rotation angle. Um, I'm just going to kick it under drawings for Civil 3D here. And cool. All right, so hop back over to Revit on the Add-ins tab, which totally makes sense where you would find that because it's an add-in. Um, import shared coordinates. So 
it's going to prompt you to pick that origin point. Now, it's critical that you get those same uh, pick points in the same order. Um, you know, one of the one of the best ways of of doing this is, uh, especially if you're working with an outside civil engineer or an outside architect, and you want to make sure you're both talking the same pick points. Uh, if your model is larger, more complex, and actually has column grid lines, those are a great way of saying, okay, my first point was A1, my second point was B12, for example. So everyone knows the exact same pick points, regardless of whether you're working within the same office or outside your office with different consultants. So uh, uh, if not, you know, just having on having that that view set to, you know, the course level of detail, so you're not getting all of those individual wall layers is also a, a big help in, in selecting, in this case, those outside corners. All right, so I want to select that one. And this one was my second point. So now it's prompting me, all right, go go grab that XML file that you just created. Are you sure? Uh, yes. All right. And nothing, right? So it didn't, you know, why isn't it rotated like it is in Civil 3D? Well, just because we imported that XML file doesn't mean it actually did anything, right? So it's still, my internal site is still current. Uh, so I need to set this one, my new site. And it basically just pulled in the same name as that XML file. So if you had named it something a little bit more uh, obvious than my shared ref point, um, it would pull, you know, read that. So there we go. So it just flipped my drawing, my view. And again, so this is based on the true north, right? So if my, my view were still set to project north, you know, after you go through this process and you're like, why isn't my building rotated? Well, just make sure it, your orientation is set to true north all right so there you go so let's jump back to civil 3d let's get rid of this guy because remember this one is just kind of placed in there arbitrarily we just uh threw it in just to get a a location for it uh within civil within uh, revit i'm going to save this now because i want to keep these changes in here and file export CAD DWG. Before you do anything, just make sure your coordinates and units are set to feet and you're using a shared coordinate system because we now have Civil 3D and Revit sort of, you know, air quotes aligned with each other uh, with regards to where in the world these are all supposed to fall. Hey, Matt. Yes, sir. So Chuck said, if he's using state plane US, it's survey feet. But we had a follow-up. It was topical to what you were just doing. Where does it put the survey point and the project base point? Was that your pick points? All right, let me uh, just kick this out to DWG here, and then we'll hop back. We'll take a look at. Turn off internal. All right, so survey point way down here, zero, zero, my ref point. Project base point way up here. All right, so hopefully that answers the question. So it, you know, it is modifying uh, the survey point, internal point, internal origin, and uh, project base point are basically right on top of each other at the uh, sort of this zero 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 of of Revit. If that makes any sense? I know this this whole subject in and of itself is uh, can be overwhelming at times. Um, You're good, Matt. You answered it. <laughs> on understanding the difference between all the different points here, uh, I will point out though there is a uh, there was a, a an AU class and I think it was last year that really, really explain this well and had a bunch of sample uh, files within uh, Revit. So as you moved the survey point or the project point, you can see how this sort of grid of, uh, you know, of information would, would adjust based on that. Um, highly encourage you to, to, to search that one out. All right, so we've got our model 
exported to Civil 3D. And one thing I want to point out is, I think I mentioned this before, but I always like to create a unique drawing that has just those objects that I want to see uh, kicked out to DWG because unfortunately we can't read the, the, the Revit file. So we have to export to RV or DWG, but we don't need everything, right? We don't need to see all the furniture. We don't need to see all the, uh, you know, all the faucets and the outlets and whatnot. So basically just, you know, strip it down to what is important is typically, uh, you know, outside face of the wall, doors, any columns or, or, you know, any, anything that may interfere with uh, uh, those entrance locations of the utilities coming into the building. All right, so back into Civil 3D, we've got our site here. We want to reference in our DWG file. There's my export two that I just created. Now, unlike uh, the first go around, we don't want to specify anything. We want insertion point B000. We want rotation, just you know, everything zero across the board or you know one for scale. And there we go, right? So it falls right into place. So we've got, so we've got the kind of going back a little bit. We've got the Recap Photo, Recap Pro, Infraworks, uh, Civil 3D, Revit, all sort of uh, jiving with each other at this point. All right. So let's take. What are we doing on time? We got ten minutes. All right. Cruising through this. Go back to no, not that one. Back in InfraWorks, we want to pull in our, no, not that one either. Oh boy, getting flustered here. Uh, we want to pull in our Revit model. Um, one thing I want to point out though is uh, if you hover over any of these icons, you know, you see this little little tooltip that says feature requires you to install Navisworks Manage. Um, if you have say 22 for InfraWorks, you want to have Navisworks manage 22 as well installed. If you don't, um, what you'll see is these little cloud icons next to some of these, these commands. So basically what it's gonna do um, with Navis installed and this data import option toggled on, it's gonna to use Navisworks locally uh, to basically do any of that sort of uh, background conversion that it needs to do. Otherwise it's uploading to the cloud, downloading it. Um, you know, so that process time could be uh, much longer compared to having, uh, you know, doing it locally. So I just wanted to point that out. If, if you happen to see those little cloud icons and you're wondering why is it taking so long to, do, to upload this thing and process it, well, that could be why. Um, all right, not that up. We want our, yeah, I don't know that I saved my model, so let me save it. Um, yep. Yeah. All right. 52, right. Open. Any other any other questions while this uh, churns in, in the background here? Now this isn't uploading the cloud. I do have Navis installed locally. Um, it's just through the you know, just the nature of processing the, the information. So any other questions? Any? Let's well, we got an off-topic one. So now Revit would you be able to? use shared coordinates when you bring in the point cloud. Uh, let's see, is that an option? Point cloud. It is. All right, let's, you know, let's find out. It should work, honestly. Hmm. Let's see what happens. All right, well, Revit does its thing in the background. Uh, let's jump back over to InfraWorks. So again, we brought it in, we brought in that data source. We need to tell it what it is. All right, so it's buildings and it's going to be NAD 83, close and refresh. Cool, all right, there it is. So it wasn't set to the correct elevation. Obviously, so one thing you'd want to take a look at, um, you know, make sure you've got the, oh, look at that, it did. 
so yeah, just just make sure um, you know when you're doing all this, make sure your elevations, your levels in Revit are set. Um, I did kind of gloss over that, kind of speeding through some of this. Um, so it looks like it did bring in that point cloud in the right location based off of those shared coordinates. So yeah, as long as uh, everything is set, everything is uh, linked properly on oh, this. That's not good. That may have something to do with my my building being partially underground there. Right, so we've got all this information. Yeah, look at that, it did actually fall into place, cool. So we've got all this information tied to each other now, right? So very, very little rework, if any, uh, when it comes to uh, pushing that information from InfraWorks to Civil 3D or Civil 3D to Revit or Revit to Civil 3D or Revit to InfraWorks, uh, you name it. It's, you know, it, it's fairly seamless. Um, and hopefully, as you saw here, it's it's actually pretty quick. It, it's, you know, not not a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, it's just a matter of knowing, you know, some of those those add-ins to to get the, the Civil 3D and the Revit in sync with each other. Uh, from there, it's just a matter of remembering, okay, I'm using shared coordinates. Shared coordinates is, is the key for all of these things uh, to fall into place wherever in the world your project is located. Um, now, unfortunately we don't have enough time, but I did want to show uh, some of the format stuff and, and how we can take all of this and dump it into, into Navisworks, which is, is pretty simple once everything is, is tied into those uh, coordinate, those shared coordinate systems. So, um, yeah, so we're pretty much right on time, right? So, so okay, I guess we, I guess we're gonna, <laughs> I guess we're gonna have a part two to this at some point, huh? Uh, to, to get through the rest of it, but um, hopefully, you, hopefully you all enjoyed this and got some, got something out of it. Um, Let's go back to the slides, please. Absolutely. And stay with us, people. So we're gonna wrap. We're gonna wrap up with uh, two final slides um, to give you ways to connect and engage with the Autodesk community. So you can explore the many ways to connect in the Autodesk community, including the global network of user groups in the Autodesk Group Network, our industry-focused communities helping your colleagues solve business challenges together. Of course, the Autodesk forums and staying connected with us on Twitter. And I'll just, I'll thank everybody for attending today. And thank you, Matt, you did it, it was awesome. You, you danced with, with chainsaws uh, up in the air and uh, that's no small feat. Um, those are all highly uh, memory intensive and CPU and graphics eating machines. So uh, we have a couple of things that the workflow seems to assume the entire project is properly referenced to a standard coordinate system. Often the surveyors has not, the survey has not tied the site to a state plane system. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know how to how to address that. You know, I've seen I've seen plenty of, of civil drawings that are just sort of randomly started, you know, somewhere close to zero zero zero, um, with no regard, <laughs> no thought whatsoever, uh, put yeah. into you know. Well, maybe it should be That's a whole new session. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I will point out that at, at the link for the session here is there, there'll be, there'll be the recording there, but there'll also be a, a discussion area too. So Matt, if you wanted to post your images that you had, you can do sure, that. Okay, in so. perfect. Yeah, perfect. All right, everybody. I hope you took your surveys and continue to stay connected in the Autodesk community and hope to see you next time. And Matt, there's going to be a next time, right? We got a lot left to do. Yeah, yeah apparently, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Looking forward to it.